Hi, there. Well, thanks. So we're so glad you came back to us. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we wanted you home at UCSB again. So it's great. Well, I have. I was an alumni. What well, I think I went '62 <laughs> before everybody. Anybody in this room was born. I think uh, to '66. <laughs> so. Well, we're going to dive into Dune. So our, our first question is, Arrakis has a reputation as being very inhospitable, inhospitable planet. Likewise, Dune itself has a reputation of being an unadaptable book. Did you relate to House Atreides' worries about surviving on Arrakis when beginning the process of adapting this novel? Um, I actually kind of did. And this, is a, this was rare for me because I, I guess I'm arrogant enough to think I can do anything, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to you know be tested uh, kind of how well I could uh, adapt many things but I've adapted a lot of things and I at first I thought well this is just like any other ad adaptation what, what would be I mean I know I knew the Lynch movie I know what Jodorowsky, Jodorowsky was going to do and uh, but I know it had been sitting there and uh, I, I was not really daunted by it till I got into the book again you know and then I said all right well the, the first thing is of course whatever it is, 800 pages, whatever the hell it is. Um, you know, I ha what I do is when I adapt something, I, I underline what I think would be something worth, uh, you know, putting in a script. And I found I, I had underlined almost the whole book. So that didn't help much. So I then did kind of a, this was prior. I, so let me back up a touch. The estate uh, wanted me to write a, tr a treatment, which is just a long explanation of what story I'm gonna be telling. And so that was kind of more than anything to protect that I wasn't going to go sort of wandering into the some other valley of death and and somehow besmirch their you know their property. So I wrote like a sixty page treatment, and then I actually did the same for the second movie, which we can discuss later. But um, so uh, then I met with um, Denis. Denis is the one who brought me on to this. Denis Villeneuve's the director, and you guys can look up who he, what he's done. He's a really wonderful talented man very generous and i had uh, i had met him i had done rewriting on the movie arrival um and uh, i liked that very much and uh he asked me if i'd be interested in this and i loved the book as a teen 15 year old but it didn't stay with we the way it stays with most people i mean it was one of a, a number of science fiction things that i liked um, but I was never a fanboy that way, you know, I, 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 I love so the world building, I love the, you know, sort of the language and, uh, and his prescience was amazing about, you know, ecology and everything else, but it was just another cultural book for me that was obviously important in the era, and, uh, and, and I knew what it represented in the movie business in a way, um, sort of one of the last discovered undiscovered franchises because it was you know one that had never been done uh, and you know to, to the satisfaction of most people and so uh i um i took on the job not really knowing if i was the right guy for the job you know I, i'm not really uh, uh, but uh, culturally i knew the book quite well i had been a hippie of a kind um i had d played with a number of psychedelics and uh and it fit into the era and the book and so this guy gave me a chance to kind of, I guess, go back in time in a way uh, to sort of an ethos that uh, was, was, was part of my life then. And so there was the book and Denis and I sat and talked at length a number of times about how we want to tell a story. And his, his big thing was, he, I said, what would be most important to you? He said, I would like to have some female perspective on this. Mm. Um, not me particularly, but that there is a female presence, a, a sensibility in the movie and that's certainly very strong we use the you know his, his mother as one example and of course the women the Bene Gesserit the uh, you know the spiritual advisors and uh, the sort of advanced state of, of, of uh, I'd say acumen and everything that the women have in this and then also I think the tactile nature of the planet with the sand dunes and all it, there's a sense I think there's a, a feminine sensibility to that I and mean, one could argue that you know but uh, I think that was kind of part of the Anyway, that was kind of my marching orders, aside from him saying, go do whatever you want, because he's a very, he's a generous guy and he's brave. And I've had enough success to, uh, you know, for him to say, let's see what your imagination brings. And uh, uh, so we worked on what I wrote um, over, you know, a year, whatever it was. Um, and uh, um, it, it, it became kind of, as I say, daunting because I, I wasn't um, as, 
I wasn't as sort of conversant, I guess, conversant with the material as I would have liked to have been. Um, and I wasn't really sure how to do some of it. Um, I know visually how to do things quite well. I have a great uh, sort of memory and mind for that. Um, but some of the stuff I wanted, how do, how do I explain, for instance, to an audience who's never read the book, you know, a whole new audience now, um, so that narration was important. And, and I, I don't like a lot of narration. So we had to show a way to visualize stuff, you know, to pe tell people about what is the world order, which is very important. Um, and so you, were very conscious, you were very conscious of making sure that obviously the Dune lo books would, would love would follow the movie easily, but you wanted to make sure that the average audience member. Could. Oh, yeah, no, I thought, you know, we have we have a whole new audience, you know, younger. Um, also, there are those who read the book and forgot about it. They didn't really remember every move in it. And it's a very complicated book. And then, of course, that you, you don't want to disappoint those who the book means so much to. So it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, and, 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 and that was the task, you know. So, I mean, and, I, and I'm very bravura in the way I write. I mean, I try things that, you know, sort of like if you play bridge, bid bold and go down. I mean, sometimes you, you know, you try things that maybe sort of your appetite is bigger than what it needs to be. And I had started, the first thing I wrote was I wanted to do, to present the planet Dune as, um, as if we were looking at the gen from the old uh, from the um, Old Testament Genesis, like and God created, and that's how I started the movie, uh, the creation of a planet, which we think is Earth, and it turns out to be odd animals, and the water goes away, and it turns out to be Dune, and it's quite I think pretty spectacular. But then Denise said to me, "Well, that's really nice, and it's un unbelievable what you've created, but." now we can't afford the rest of the movie <laughs> so that was the end of that idea <laughs> so uh you know and, and then the, the rest of i mean i brought on um my assistant was quite familiar with the book so she gave me some hints but also uh, by just coincidence my partner's a doctor and a real good friend of hers uh his i'm getting a little attenuated here but his daughter was getting a phd in dune now we can debate if that's a good idea or not, but she was that attached to the book, and she gave me incredible notes on every chapter on what she felt that the you know what 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 was implied and what was meant, and you know I took those and I used those for what I thought was the best purpose or what I threw out what I didn't think would work, and I proceeded. Then I think once I felt comfortable that way, I so doing what is a normal adaptation for me, you know, there's certain. You know, if you're looking at sort of linear structure of drama, you follow the rules of Shakespeare and it doesn't change very much, uh, no matter if you stand it on its head or go backwards and forwards like Pulp Fiction or something. You, you know, you have to define the problem in Act One, complicate the problem in Act Two and have a catharsis in Act Three and or either have the catharsis or what they call DSX machina, you, you resolve it by, you know, some God in a machine. But I'm, I, my point being that once you condense it that way, it's then that's the that's 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 the dramatic structure. You could have four acts or three acts or five acts. It wouldn't doesn't change. And so within that box, um, you know, you start constructing this tale and who's going to be the most important thing. And what are you going to lose? What are the things you throw out? You know. Well, that's a good question because that was what we were wondering. So were you worried? I mean, the book the book has so many politics and is a large universe. Were you concerned at all in the early process? Like, I don't want to. Uh, compromise character development yeah like, no i i, I never I, want to I mean, that first maybe the characters and yeah well I, I i mean i think the way i approach writing um for whatever i've written is i start with theme and then you character and plot are are, are synonymous in a way because characters will so, uh, dictate the plot to a certain extent even though there's storytelling you have to do and when you're you know obviously following uh, doing an adaptation in the most cases unless they're just bad books and sometimes bad books make the best movies and bad plays do too you then could throw out things you know but dune i think we had to stay kind of hide bound to much of what's there you know um uh so that was my task and it it, uh, it was a job then you know uh, and i loved it i loved doing it i loved imagining what i could and denis was nothing but you know um optimistic and encouraging and um and then i turned in my draft which was you know very long I'm, I'm, i tend to write probably way too long and then denis did some little things on it and then they wanted me to come back and i was busy doing something else and then they brought another writer who's a very good writer named john spade who came up with a great idea of 
switching the uh, Dr. Kine, which was a male in the uh, book, uh, to to a female. They made a, a person of color, but um, I thought that was a very a very smart uh, move. And he did some really good. He's a real uh, aficionado of the book, and I think he kept the book kind of grounded. I was kind of off in space, and not to use a pun. Yeah, but it's interesting you mentioned Dr. Kine because the, obviously the switch. But I thought she had a more noble death. Like it was from the book, it was actually a really curious take on the character. Yeah, well, it was quite different. Yeah, um, uh, and I and by honestly, I, I I did the more traditional with the the, the doctor um, uh, in my version, and so I I, did, I thought it was interesting. I thought it did open up, and I think we needed the uh, the, fem the female character it was a smart idea. Um, and then and then they you know we ended with uh, John John did his work, which I said was Yeoman's work, and um, I think he. He put it back on his feet because um, I I can be a little bit off in space as I say and then um, and then they th then they started to begin to um, uh, Denis went off to make the movie and had certain things he needed changed and we and I would they asked me back to do some changes and once it was done we did some changes so everybody it, I'll tell you the unique thing about it and that's uh, all three of us are listed as credited writers and I got to say that it was a, a very seamless um, collaboration for three people. I mean, I work with Denis and Denis worked with John more than John and I work together, but I've been on movies where you know people fight over credits and you see four different writers and sometimes it tones off or you have people sounding different. And this was pretty amazing. And, and I think in the, in the long run, I think, um, I think we, we did make it adaptable, this book. I mean, I, I think the movie's really good, you know? Um, and uh, uh, so I, I, I think we did a good job, yeah. Now, obviously, the most important character, oh, not uh, most important, the, the central character is Paul. I mean, he leads us into the world. What were your initial thoughts about how you wanted to portray Paul from the book to the screen? Well, Paul, I mean, I, right away, I was, I was taken with him because I like the idea of somebody who needs to, who has a responsibility they may not want. You know, I find that I've, I've known people in my life um, so I won't mention who, but some famous, but some famous rock and rollers who do not like the fact this obligation to their fans, you know, they love their fans, but they don't really have much more to give than their music. And so that, the, but the whole idea then that none of them, those people don't think they're prophets either. And this guy who has this mixed sort of human side and also this, um, well, he's a, he's a prophet, right? So he has to come to grips with that. So I would say the movie one particularly is about him becoming a man, and movie two is going to be about whether he becomes a prophet, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, and I also, it opened up things for me in sort of in a quote spirituality way where I could have him dealing with things like dream, a lot of dream stuff, and also thinking about uh, that he can see the future but he can't, he, maybe he could change it, maybe he can't. I love that whole notion. Yeah, um, but we, my students were talking about, they really love the notion that he was misinterpreting the visions quite often too. Yes, he wasn't yes. Right. It was interesting because the audience got to follow along with him, kind of like misinterpret along with him. So it actually, I in a lot of ways grounded. That was, that was structured that way. Cause I, I like to, um, I like in a way unreliable narrators so that, um, you know, and you, some of my movies, which are obviously much different, like Forrest Gump, he's a completely unreliable narrator. He says things that are just not what, the, he sees them that way, but they're just not what they are. And so the, those are always an interesting way to approach things, but because you then, the audience is along with you, as you say. And in this case, in particular, that he's not even aware what these visions are and what they're for, what, where they're leading him, you know? So that's, and so that's a journey for you with this character, yeah. Yeah, uh, the question I asked you about Timothy, like obviously it's a hard character for a young actor to play. I mean, he has to be respected, a political leader at each, really at such a young 17, age. 17, yeah, 17. 17, a fighter, like, and the future messiah. How did you think Timothy kind of captured your version of Paul? I thought he did great. I mean, I think he he, he didn't play it too young and and, and he, had, he had enough arrogance um, and also enough sort of, be slightly willful you know that he was going to be who he was um so that i think he'd be great i mean i, I don't know these parts are thankless you know because you either you know you walk on and people you know let's say mark hamill or something you know you you have to be uh you know somebody you uh, how do you it's, it's a, an interesting thing it's like because your question reminds me i i did a uh, q a with uh 
Denise very smart. Usually you do these kind of kind of Oscar trots, right? You go out, you do a Q and A, and usually it's you know with the big actors or it's just a director and you and I've done those with on this movie. But he sent us out all of us with uh, in various uh, places. Like I, I went out once to USC, for instance, at a, their film school had a big screening of it, and he sent the sound guys. And I thought that was an interesting idea. So their their point of view about the sound was really unique and interesting, but it's it's the same way of thinking about Paul. I don't know what it feels like to be a guy who might be a messiah. And they were saying, what does a sound wor- I mean, a sandworm sound like, you know? I mean, it's the same kind of thing. You have to invent it because you have to then sort of have an imagination to create it in a way. Um, and of course we know where he took him in, in the book of Dune, but still, I think that's what Timothy Chalamet's struggle was. And we try to give him as much, you know, fodder to, to play, you know? Yeah, I actually, you know, I, I'm gonna do a little like the book versus the movie thing. I really enjoyed the scene uh, with the Duke and uh, Paul on Caladan, which is not right. a book. They basically jumped to Arrakis. Which one, the one, uh, the one uh, at the grave, grave site, because it kind yeah. of gave us the sense, was that important for you to kind of ground their relationship? Yeah, it's really interesting you brought up that scene because I think the first attempt at it really didn't quite work. Um, so we redid it. And then the second attempt didn't really quite work. And we did a third version of it, which is in the movie now. Uh, so that was about that relationship. And I, I spent a lot of time uh, working with Oscar Isaac um, on how we, how would we do this and about then what does it mean about, you know, sort of your, the history and, you know, the, your descendants and all that stuff, you know. And I thought, well, it also set up, it also set up the tragedy much more when they do Yes, that. of course, yeah. It, it just yeah. like, you see the great, I thought Yeah, he's a good. unique, I mean, I think, I think the Duke is a unique character because he really kills him off pretty quickly in a way. There's not yeah. that, I mean, there's not that much of him, you know what I'm saying? We know, and, and he's particularly human. So he doesn't have a lot of the defenses a lot of these other people have, you know. Now, obviously, we talked a little about you said women, you know, you and any one of the women represented. One of the most complex characters from the book, and I would argue probably one of the hardest to adapt, was Lady Jessica. Yeah. How did you get into or her mindset? And I, th- I, I, um, I don't know. I mean, it's always a good question. I don't even know how some of these things come about. It's just what I do. You know, it's quite interesting you say that. Uh, I won't name who it is. A director stopped by this morning and wanted to talk about an old thing I had written, and I didn't. I didn't really, now part of this is probably because I'm old, but I didn't really remember it with the kind of detail that he, because he had just read it. So I couldn't remember very, so I don't remember particularly, I just know, I felt she, that she was very contemporary, you know, that she really was a contemporary character and she was very conflicted because I think she did love this man who's supposed to be her husband and everything else. And yet she has these powers being somebody who's superior in a way. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. And, you know, it was interesting because the book starts with the, the box scene, Gumba Jabbar scene, and we'll definitely get into that. But I like the choice of going to setting them up at the, the breakfast. The mother, yeah. Yeah. son, you know, you establish Paul's powers. He's a teenager who doesn't want to use a voice so early in the morning. How important was it for you? Did you really think you needed that to kind of set their relationship? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and also I think it all comes off of the dream and all that stuff. So you have a unusual circumstances to begin with uh, as to where we are, what's real, what isn't. In that sense, you know. Yeah, but I think we needed to have uh, a grounding of their relationship, and and then of course with the when we when he does the test, um, we have her behind the door, you know, and she's petrified as to because she's actually done something she wasn't supposed to do, you know, give birth to. Uh, a, a human child, you know. So for that scene, though, because the box scene, is, of course, is one of the most important scenes from the book. Yeah. Uh, what, did you, what did you feel about when you were adapting that? Do you just want to? How do you encapsulate? All I mean, that? I think that I think that was pretty much verbatim from the book. I don't re- I don't remember much that was quite different from it. I mean, I was a little concerned about the staging of it because in the book, it's exactly what you see, kind of. But her behind the door and all, that's kind of old, funky kind of, you know. Uh, but because uh, I was going to do things where maybe she sort of hovered or something or something interesting that, uh, in other words, because this was very sort of traditional behind the door in a theater sense, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, that scene, uh, yeah, that's hard to top, you know. That's a pretty great moment, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so I mean, I think that's part of my task in anything I write is do no harm when you can, you know. Because uh, it's it's easy to think you can you're better than what's there, and it, it's not. It just never happens. 
Now, the, the Benny Gesserit, I mean, there's a lot of the religious overtones in the, in the book and in the movie, too, in the Benny Gesserit. Uh, what was important for you to make sure stayed in the movie or maybe something had to get cut because of time? I don't think anything much got cut from that particularly. Um, I think that was it's probably the most important part of the movie, quite honestly. And I know that's how Denis felt because they, they started to represent what the movie was, was, was kind of eventually about in a way. I mean, that's the spirituality of the whole thing. Um, you know, that and then obviously the Fremen you're, you're into other worlds, you know, that, are, that I think makes uh, uh, Dune, this book and this series of books unique um, because it has these ingredients that are, I, I don't think they're as common in some of the other fantasy, space fantasy kind of thing. Now, uh, do you feel like, do you, did you go into it thinking, you know, there's scenes we just have to do, there's no way we cannot do it, or did sometimes you feel like we do have to make the choice of cutting certain aspects of the book? Because well, I, I think, I mean, I think you, you're very smart because you, you said to me about character. And I think so then you can go to each of the characters and decide how much are we going to see of each of these people and what do they represent? So we know we have to, uh, you know, have to do the, the bad guy, right? I mean, in other words, great films are built on the backs of villains. Um, and uh, so how are we going to show him? How is he going to be represented? You know, and he sort of came up with this Apocalypse Now look where he looks like sort of Marlon Brando, you know. Um, in Apocalypse Now. Um, and I think he did a really good job with that, uh, you know, with all that weight the guy's supposed to have and everything else. So, yeah, he felt pretty evil. I mean, uh, so I, there was very little of anything taken out of his stuff. Um, I think it's more about some of the politics, some of the palace stuff, um, uh, a little less of the warfare in some areas and more in others. I mean, so I don't think it was any big, huge lifts. Actually, somebody who knows Dune better than I do would probably tell you what came out, to be honest with you. Well, I, the, the emperor will force me out of the Q&A moderator guild if I don't ask one question about that, uh, leaving something out of the movie. Uh, the dinner banquet scene was a big part of the book and a lot of that politics. Was there any kind of, we just had, it just did not fit in the story? I think it became, uh, you know, you, it became a, a um, it's just too conversational. It's so exp it's expository too. So you have to keep, exp you know, um, I think that, I think that part of the politics became less important to this movie, whether right or wrong. And, you know, cause we really don't get into much the sort of the economics of spice either. You know, I mean, we, we, we talk about it. We, you know, we, we, we know what it is, why it's so uh, valuable. And uh, I mean, but I think he, he tried, I mean, I, I say he, because I think Denis tried to make things as explicable as possible and yet show them in a really fascinating way and take you to where you feel you're actually living in another world. Um, that scene, I think, in the book might be 50 pages, too. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, I mean, uh, how, did you, how do we could have taken it down to, you know, three minutes, which is what a scene should be, basically. Um, that's hard, you know. Uh, also, it was another interesting choice I found is in the book, we kind of know the Baron's plan. We know Dr. Yu is going to betray, you know, in the movie, you took a different approach where you didn't reveal his betrayal until he actually betrays the Duke. Why do you think that the suspense? Um, I, I don't know if I, I may have had a little, I, I might not be so happy about that. <laughs> oh, I'm, not, I'm that. not unhappy about it. I, um, I would have liked some indication somebody here is, you know, and that, cause that's what they did in the book, right? The, you know, something's rotten in Denmark. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I might've, I think maybe when I wrote my first version, he was, it was more present that he was, you know, could have been somebody not to trust. Uh, and this was the way Denny wanted to uh, dramatize. I have no problem with it. I think he ended up in the same place, but that's, that happens all the time. You know, what happens when you, work with a director as, and I've done it so many times, you, you have your idea of how it should be. First of all, they might have the book's idea. Then let's assume it's an adaptation. Then you have your idea how it should be and you have the director's idea and he's gonna win 98% of the time. But what you learn to do is find a third way so that the director can have some sense of what he wants. And also you can retain what you wanted to some extent. So there's, a, as I said, there's a third way that could, and that was, I think, at least from my point of view, what happened with that. And then he may have done something with John, the other writer that they both felt slightly differently than I did. And that's what they ended up deciding to do, you know, which is fine. 
Yeah, but I did like the relationship which you guys captured between Dr. Yu and Paul. Yeah. yeah it, really, it really helped me because when he betrays the Duke, I'm heartbroken. But I know deep down he did love Paul. Yes, exactly right. That's exactly I thought right. that was actually one of the- I mean, I always felt the, the one thing in the book that, I mean, that I, I didn't actually, it's not dislike, but it's hard to do when we don't know Dr. Yu's relationship with his wife. So, you know, I'm saying, so all of a sudden that kind of comes out of the blue. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, the whole machinations of what went on there with his wife. Uh, and I maybe, maybe in a different world, I may have talked about his wife and maybe he had talked to Paul about it. I mean, so that would have been a choice, you know. Um, I don't remember ever going there, but I thought that came late in the day in that, in the book. Uh, that wasn't quite, uh, I don't like, I don't like to have things that are just surprise people that way, you know. Did you have to, for, for the Baron, did you feel like you had to update him a little for a modern audience? I think so. And I think yeah. it was the, the look of them and everything else. And uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Of, I don't think I did much different. I think we had we had to make a decision, which they did. Um, and we did. I And I, I agreed with it with because in the book, he's like, a, a you know, a child molester. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, that, that got a little strong. So I don't know how well that would have that would have maybe taken you a bad direction you know it's interesting i've learned you have to be careful on where you're going to lose the audience uh, and you may not get them back in a way and i'll give you an example um in forrest gump uh, when i originally wrote it i had you saw jenny kill her father she runs over him it's a kind of funny scene actually because she runs over him like a cotton bale or thing and and he had molested her, abused her. So he kind of lets it put this that way. He might've deserved it, right? But as soon as we did it, I think we shot it. Um, and then Bob Zemeckis said, you know what? I'm not sure we're ever gonna, it's not that we don't forgive her for it, but we may always think of her as a murderess, you know? And and that was interesting. So we never see it, you know? And so uh, it never it never came to pass. And so we didn't have to have that hanging over us. So, and it's an interesting thing that you, you gotta be careful. You, if you go down a path, forget about it after that. You're not gonna be able to say, sorry, you know, I you gotta retract that. Of course, one of the two most painful moments in the book is the death scenes of the Duke and the Duncan Idaho. Uh, how did you view like trying to make sure the Duke scene was preserved from the book, but also translating for the uh, visual medium comparably, comparably? Um, I think it was just sort of a necessity, you know? Uh, I, didn't, I don't know how we would have got around that. Um, uh, I mean, all these entrances and exits are well-planned, you know? And, and, and the, these kind of movies particularly, because you have, you know, five or six principal, you know, we know who they are, Duncan Idaho and, you know, um, uh, Gurney Halleck, all those people, and you have to give them their time in the sun, you know? So that you, you schedule kind of, as you're writing, it's almost like a schedule of who's going to appear now and how are they going to appear, who's going to teach him how to fight, who's, you know, all these things. And then you have to deal with what happened, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the eventual outcome and then some carry over the movie too, as you well know. Um, yeah, I was actually, one of the things that struck us was Duncan Idaho. I, I really, we really enjoyed the choice of giving him and Paul a much kind of a deeper relationship. They yeah, no, I like that very much. The, the bonding at the beginning where you, the jokes were, you put on the muscle was cute, but it showed affection and showed something. Was that something you really wanted to make sure? Yeah, you, yeah, or, we wanted that, that to be a, a real uh, close relationship and that you became, um, you know, really wanting him to remain in the movie and then we'll see what happens, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah it did pay off. I mean, the death scene was, I thought, very yeah. powerful in the movie, yeah. like the, the sacrifice. and the, you, know, you never know, he may reappear. <laughs> Oh, well, we would be very excited if that was the case because uh, we all like Jason Momoa too. Yeah, um, no kidding, no kidding. Um, let's talk a little about like, there was two scenes and with little setup and payoff. Um, when we were watching, like I mentioned in the green room, virtual green room, that we got to watch the movie in the theater a couple of days ago, which nice. was great. Yeah. Uh, the scene that really struck out for the students and myself was when Rebecca Ferguson, Lady Jessica uses the power, her powerful voice to voice, kill the yeah. guards. Yeah. And it also flips later when Paul uses it against the mother and calls him a freak. How did you kind of review those scenes and really their relationship? I think uh, the interesting thing is that uh, they were really tricky because, you know, you can't do it like soda voce. I mean, it becomes like a bad joke. 
and yet you want to have the sense that they are so he had a device sort of a sound scheme for it you know and then we also did a lot of um almost like death signing with it you know so where they could you know you know talk to each other without revealing what they're talking about so and then he did a timber to the voices that sounded different you know so yeah i mean i i don't know on the page i probably put it in like italics you know what i'm saying so that uh, you could see the difference but it's very it was diff i mean he had a, he had to do that as a director yeah and conversely i, I thought the scene was really powerful in the tent where you know Paul had a delayed reaction to his father's death, like the trauma of it, and just screaming at his mother through the voice. I thought that right. was really a yeah. Nice I love part. that. I like that. Well, the the voice, the visions. I mean, I think all those things are what make the movie uh, as you know, sort of interesting and powerful as it is. You know, they're 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 quite different. You know, and also it was nice. Also, way to uh, set up Shawnee. Yes. Was, yeah. Really well, that was why can you, when you can have a dream, you know, of maybe she exists, maybe she doesn't, and. Uh, and, she, and I think he did an interesting thing because he made her certainly a part of the movie, but not en enough to overwhelm it. And then we'll see what happens with them. You know, I actually, in my version, went not much, but like two steps further with him, with the Fremen. Um, uh, they decided to, you know, they went like that. End the story for this for this version. Um, that's interesting. Uh, well, let's talk while you bring up the Fremen. I mean, the six, it was, uh, Doom was written in the 60s, uh, had allegories of imperialism, colonialism, and the Fremen culture has roots in Islam, Native Americanism, land. How did you uh, approach there, really, you know, the portrayal of the Fremen for a modern audience? Oh, I thought, I thought that was the easiest thing because everybody sort of likes a, a good revolutionary, you know? And then also that they were so adept at um, living in this incredibly, you know, uh, death-defying environment so they were you know they were such skilled as um as we you know as indigenous people are and you know like you know the comanches would ride in bands of five and six people like you know sort of um uh guerrilla band but they were the best horsemen that ever uh, probably you know maybe the mongolians are something that walked the earth um and so people who have special skills like that i think people find really interesting so these people were adept with the desert and the walking, you know, to not to, to not attract the sandworm, all those things. So I think those things are kind of cool, if nothing else, you know. And then also they become kind of spiritual and everything, you know. In other words, there's there are those of us who live outside, you know, the the um, uh, you know uh, the pale in a way, or you know at least you know live off the grid and everything else. And I, those people could be fascinating. Why not? Well, speaking of coolness, and I have one fandom question for me. Uh, the sandworms, you mentioned the sandworms, are of course one of the more dramatic elements from the book in the world of Dune. How fun was it then to write uh, the sandworms? Oh, I loved it. And I, I love particularly um, writing the scene um, when we when they first encounter it with uh, with the with the ship that's trapped, you know, the uh, the working. Yeah. You know, that, um, I think I went, I don't remember that. I think I went a step further with Paul doing something to avoid getting eaten by the sandworm in the, in the, in the, in that scene when he's trapped on the, uh, you know, when he goes down to try to rescue those guys. But I don't remember anymore, but it was a, a it was a little different, slightly different. Um, I, the, I love the scene where Paul actually stares it down. Well, yeah, no, that's great. That's that. good. That's it was good. such a great emotional connection mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, I thought that was a beautiful moment. Yeah. Cause they weren't I just, gotta say, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think, um, not that the movie, you know, the movie has whatever its flaws may be, but I don't think there are too many missteps. I mean, I think Denis, um, I really honor the guy because it's a Herculean job what he had to do, obviously. I mean, we all take it for granted. All these guys who do these kind of huge, you know, Chris Nolan, David Finn, whatever. I mean, the dire directors are really pretty amazing because they, they have so many choices they have to make and, and one bad choice can be a disaster. So for instance, like the sound thing we we're talking about, that he has to make a decision on, on whatever, whatever is happening on the screen. Do we want the sound effects to be the loudest? Do we want the dialogue? Do we want to hear it or not? And do we want the music? You know, so you have three elements all competing, and he has to make the right choice in each case. You know, and sometimes silence is even more scarier. And be, that might be even better. So, it's, but silence is like a sound effect where you take the sound out, basically. You know, or maybe it's the wind. You're right. In other words, so. 
um, they, these, I mean, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing skill these directors have. Yeah, one of the things is also because I, I, we, you know, we read the script because they, they released it online and we could actually read it. It's amazing how, and the way you guys wrote it and the way Denny directed it, for a movie that could be really talky, like it's an overexposition, you guys can do a lot of things visually and let the actors breathe. Yeah, well, I mean, that would be a, a strong suit I have, obviously a strong suit of uh, myself, uh, Denny and, and John. We, we felt the story oddly could tell itself, you know, without having to, you know, one of the things you don't want is to, screenwriting 101 will teach you too much exposition is you, it's a kiss of death. Because that's, uh, that's sort of a bad television thing where they're telling you what's going on, you know, rather than you experiencing it. Um, and so the most, the hardest kind of writing is subtextual, which is where you then write kind of a metaphor and you don't talk about, you, you're telling what you're feeling about things and showing in a way how it relates to what's happening, but you don't talk about what's going on. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll give some other metaphor about it. Well, that may be one of the reasons you guys didn't include the Princess Erlion. She narrates actually the book. Yes, that's you right. That's right. Well, that was a big decision. Out. That was a big decision not to have that narration. You know, we do have a few little things with the, the quotations, you know. Right. Um, but the, yeah, we, uh, that was a big decision uh, not to have the narration that way. Yeah. And also, I thought it was helpful having Shawnee actually be the voice at the beginning because she's a character we're going to meet anyway. Yes, that's it right. It does set her up and Paul. Yeah. And, uh, well, we might as well talk about it. So the climax has a lot going on. Shawnee and uh, Paul finally connect, you know, together, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, you know, she, obviously, uh, he has to fight the knife fight. And it's a beautiful moment where he moves from childhood into a leadership. Like, and he's getting slightly reviewed differently, still not fully accepted, but warming up to you. Was it challenging to try to have all that going on in such a short, tight scene? Well, I think that's uh, uh, I think that's our job. You know what I'm saying? That you want to have so that when you come to the culmination, that you have a lot of balls going in the air, so that um, you can you may resolve some of them, and some things like in this was not resolved. But but I know we were trying to our task was to try to get him to where at least it felt like he entered manhood. Um, he he left a, you know boy behind, um, and I think we succeeded at that. Yeah, and I, thought, and I thought the fight scene, I mean, the chilling moment, which I know yeah, is a book, yeah. but when he realized that he just said that Paul does not want to kill anyone. That's right. Like, That's it, right. Just, it was such a moving... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, to go against his ethos, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so what you, you mentioned, so what... So what can we talk about the second one? Is there anything we can say? Is there anything... I mean, I can tell you I did a 60-page treatment that followed basically the rest of the book with some things I can't tell you because I had some ideas and and I know that um, they asked me to do it and I told them I had other worlds to conquer and not because I don't love this, but I do. I mean, at 70, my age, 76, 77, I, I have a number of projects I'm working on that other things I'd like to address, you know? But I'm sure at some point I will do work on it. Um, and I love the thing um, and I love Denis. Um, and so that, uh, I think they're going, you'll now go into the world of the Fremen and you're going to, you know, find out a lot about what makes them tick. And then, you know, what's the forces that are going to try to destroy them and how does this planet survive without water and all those things, you know, a lot of ec ecological stuff, which is pretty great. Yeah, which was available in the book of the environmental themes and yeah. predicting global warming, ironically enough. That's so. exactly <laughs> right. No, I know. And by the way, the first Earth Day was 1964. So in other words, we were we've all been prepared for many years. So um, was there anything you but so there was there anything you wish though you could have brought in from the second book, maybe into your story or, um, or the second half of the book? Yeah. Um, no, not really. No, I mean I think the things are all there that they'll, that will be done the right way. I mean, in other words, I think I've I've had enough conversations with Denis about what how he sees it, you know. So um I, if I had to, this isn't a fault of anything. It's just sometimes I like to go out of the box a little more, you know, and I probably would have done something a little different imagine, with some oddball imagination stuff in the first movie, but uh, I don't know if anybody would have liked it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, that's fine. That's well, fine. everybody seems to love this movie. And, oh, I know, know, that's why. So yeah. I'm glad I didn't tamper with it, you know? <laughs> and you know, and you say, of all the movies, this is the type of movie, Lord of the Rings was similar. Yeah. You know, they're so faithful to the book any misstep you know it would have been you know people would have told you 
Yeah, and I, I think one of the things is that Denis was very respectful of this book and uh, didn't want to make it a piece of pop art in any way. You know, he didn't want to sort of make it the look of what David Lynch had, and that's how David Lynch's uh, eyeball was on this. Uh, so this is Denise, you know, and I think it did it, it, at least it 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 it, uh, link, it 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 was common with what how I felt about it, you know, when I was writing it. So, well, we were very excited when the, the second film got greenlit. So me too. <laughs> I was like, was oh, like come I, on. I love that. I, I love people come out. I was so glad people came out to the movie. Yeah, well, we like, were sweating I, it out. I, Believe me, we were sweating it out uh, because. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, we, ha we had to reach a certain number, uh, just dollars wise to get there. And then they did. And so that was great. Oh, so we're going to open up in a few minutes, but I, switching gears a bit, uh, I want to talk some of your origin story. So you are at UCSB. How do you think your experience here at UCSB prepared you as a screenwriter? I think it was amazing because I think I had, uh, I remember one professor, Scott Mamaday, um uh was i mean there were certain professors who just made a mark on me and uh um and some names i'd forgotten and i apologize but that um i was an english major um in english history kind of um but i mean it, it so much enlightenment like i remember russian literature class and uh you know reading people i had never heard of you know turgenev and i mean so it all informed me about um uh one of the things in my life was that I never, I never knew what I was going to quite do. And I got, I got, I had children very young. And so, uh, cause I, they asked me recently, uh, you know, did you, what would you have done if you hadn't been a screenwriter? And I, I honestly had never really thought about it very much, not because I thought I was going to be a screenwriter, but that I was more concerned about sort of getting a roof over the head and getting food on the table for the kids, you know? So um, it, it just, but I was always writing, so uh, and I, I love writing. And I and I went I went to Columbia and made some short films and this and that. So um, and I always was very steeped in the movies and books and the mo books and movies. Um, so I mean I I'm pretty conversant with most movies made in a way. I'm not like Marty Scorsese or something, but I'm 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 not bad, you know. Uh, so and I have as I said a good visual head, so I can remember what's kind of I could borrow from and what struck me in in a movie, you know, that somehow could resurface in a way in what I'm writing. And you mentioned the agreement, you get to work with Marty. So that must've been pretty cool. Oh my God. That was a, yeah, no, I, I look, I've worked with, I've, uh, I think I've had 25 movies made. I mean, I started really young and I realized, uh, as I said, I'm six, six, I'll be 77 in March. And, uh, I, my first movie was made when I was 19. So it's almost 60 years in the business, you know, so it's, I'm sort of ridiculous, but the point being more than anything, I got to work with these incredible directors. I mean, I'm my best friend in the world is probably David Fincher and, um, you know, Marty. I mean, that was like, uh, I'd never worked with Marty. We had, we had planned to work together on two or three things we had tried to talk together through and we never got quite there. And um, uh, he, he was just, he's, he's, he's wonderful because he'll encourage you to try anything. And if you say, I think the movie should be done with people walking backwards, he'll try it, you know? because uh, he's really brave and uh, has the confidence to do it really well. Um, but I've worked with, I mean, I even worked with Akira Kurosawa. I did a, um, oh. I did a, a part of a screenplay for him and, you know, I got a lovely thank you. So I, in other words, I've been blessed to have these incredible creative people that were a part of my life, you know. Well, you mentioned before, but I guess life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Never do. So how did you get involved with Forrest Gump? Uh, Forrest Gump was uh, uh, sort of a failed book. Um, uh, it, I think it sold okay. Um, it was quite, uh, I had done a, another script for, for the woman who produced Forrest Gump and she, uh, uh, she introduced me to Tom Hanks and because Tom was potentially going to do this other movie and that, that thing didn't work out, but she then gave me the book to Forrest Gump and I read it and I, I was mixed on it. I thought it was kind of farcical for my taste. You know, it was, it was different to, to the extent from the movie significantly in some areas. Um, the guy weighed like in the book 500 pounds and he went to space with a monkey and this and that. And uh, they were just, they were bigger, sort of more farcical than I liked, but I like something about this, the kind of the soul of the thing. And um, I, I told, I said, Tom, would you read this and see if this is worth us, you know, doing together? And 
he said it's crazy but why not you know and so i just felt permission to go write whatever i wanted to with it you know so um and so i got to imagine this whole world of this guy you know of who's his life and I don't know, it's a lot of irony and a lot of try to be funny. And then I got this great director, Bob Zemeckis, who's oddball and likes to put sticks in people's eyes, you know, and everything else. And uh, so it's just one of those things of, uh, like alchemy, you know, that somehow you can't, you can't plan on. I mean, when we, had, when we were so successful, I remember um, some screening we had, I think in San Jose and some big, huge theater. And we had, they had, they had like focus group cards, you know, how people go as a test audience and they wrote with their opinions and they check boxes and we were flying home. And, uh, the, I think the president, uh, Sherry, Dan, uh, uh, Sherry Lansing of Paramount said, you just went into uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark territory. That's how much they love the movie. So, I mean, and then I remember Zemeckis saying, we'll never be here again. And that's true. I'm not sure I've had many, many successes, thank God. And, Nothing felt like Forrest Gump, though, you know, as, with all the nominations I've had and all the wonderful movies that people have liked. Uh, uh, that was unique, you know. Well, we're gonna, I'm gonna invite one of my student producers, uh, okay. Mason Campbell, to the screen. He has some open mic questions from the audience. So, Mason, please join us. Hey. Hi, Eric. Nice to meet you. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So we have our first question from Aileen. Mentats are very prevalent in the book, but the movie does not focus on them. What was the decision behind this? Um, these were just decisions that Denis would make. You know, in other words, what he wants to emphasize and what he does. And I mean, uh, one, you know, what could argue me that's a bad decision. But uh, in other words, at some point you only you have, you know, Fincher told me this. He said, you, can, you can't do a, somebody's whole life as a movie. You can only give an impression of somebody's life and that you have two and two and a half hours, maybe three if you want to do that. So it's the same thing. Here you have this book, this giant book that has all these kind of delicious details and uh, outlooks and imaginations and some things have to go. And that, that might be of this particular person's favorite thing, you know, and maybe they would maybe it could have been represented. But you also don't want to shortchange you or all of a sudden you just sort of throw it in and you don't follow up on it. So it's just choices like everything else in life, you know, and, uh, I, and in this movie, I think we made mo mostly the right choices. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next we have one from Sierra. Um, you mentioned a bit earlier, but there have been some past attempts and adaptations of Dune in the past. Did you have any specific goals in mind when setting out to write the screenplay to differentiate this adaptation from the previous ones? Um, I think I wanted to make sure that the the the, the movie was. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the I, I, like when I wrote *Star Is Born*, I said, "Why am I doing this?" You know, I don't know. You know, it's been done three times and this and that. But I think for two reasons. One, personally, I wanted to make sure I felt still vital for young people that I could write things that young people could relate to, and it certainly spoke to the audience. Um, and also, I think certain things are universal that you can say, and that the Dune at least you know pre presents in a way that you can you can do in such and as a movie did. In other words, and you can be mesmerized by it and kind of enthralled in it and excited by it. So that that's always one of the motivating factors that you you know. It's when when we Forrest Gump came out, uh, Zemeckis and Hanks and I went around to various theaters just to see how the audience was enjoying it. And I remember walking up to the Village Theater in Westwood and the, the, the lobby was all dark. And I said, oh, God, nobody's here, you know. And then we looked on the, the box office and it said every show was sold out. And we walked inside and we just, the kids from UCLA were just all over the aisles and everything. And we had the greatest time. And, you know, that's what you want. You want to somehow, that's why you do it. You know, you want to get, obviously, you want people to love what you do, but to have people have fun with it, to laugh, to cry, you know, all those things that you say, they're cliches. Um, that's what it's all about, you know? And so Dune was the same way, same way. Great to hear. Um, next up, we have one from Alan, who says that one of the things that seems to make the novel Dune a timeless classic is that can be met, it can be read through many different lenses. Ecology, economics, politics, psychedelics, colonialism. How did you approach incorporating all these various layers in the script? Only that? interested in the psychedelics. <laughs> hallucin only the hallucinogenic no i think we that was a part of that's like why do you do the book you know in other words you once go once you've read the book you know what the task is and uh and that's what's great about it because uh, i mean 
and the directors love these things because it's it's purely world building. I mean, where is this place? I mean, in other words, it's, you know, we can imagine it's on the other side of the moon. You know, it's like wonderful. I, I'll say this that I think I think Francis Coppola told me this that really great movies exist way past when you watch them because you keep thinking as if they're real. Like you know, somehow you know Al Pacino's still out there. You know, trying to defend his family and Marlon Brando that that the whatever movies you love that they're still existing in some plane i mean there's something very primal about it and that's one of the great things about dune i think there's a primal quality to it and it's only going to get better the second movie i'm sure will not make whatever errors we did in the first one and it will probably be like lord of the rings each i think each movie became something that was more that became more important in a way you know um somebody asked on here and i'll be glad to share this uh about my work process. Um, can I answer this? Sure, please. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I look at it as a job and in a good way. I mean, I'm, I, I love coming to work in quotes every day. I start at eight and I work till like one in the afternoon. And then that's about as much creativity I can do. And then I'll work again at night. Um, I don't outline very much, except I always know what the beginning of the piece is and the ending. And the only one I think this change was in Munich and only because he wanted it set where the World Trade Center was you know, no longer there, but he, he put it in the World Trade Center. Um, I work from a really old movie program and if you go look up, uh, I, I did a little thing on, it's kind of funny, on I think a thing on, that the Academy has called Creative Spark, but I use a DOS program, um, which runs out of memory after 40 pages. Um, I'm just superstitious, I guess, and also just old fashioned. Um, and so uh, I, because you can't, uh, it's called Movie Master. You can't, um, you can't email it or anything. So I have to eventually, I have to turn the whole thing over them to retype it into a thing called Final Draft, which is what everybody uses. Um, what else can I say? So that's kind of my process. Is but it's just work every day, and I, I, I love it. If I if I know when I when I'm done for the day, if I know what the next three scenes are, I'm ecstatic because I know what, what I can wake up to, you know. Um, and at my age now, and having had you know so many things done and made, you know, mostly good, some not so great, um, it's still a great challenge. And it's like a great being a journalist. You get to go into all these worlds and do research. And I can't tell you the number of places I've been, the people I've met. It's like unbelievable. You know? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. One final question from our audience. Um, Shangas asks, you've written tons of fantastic characters over the course of your career. If you had to pick which character from any of your films is your favorite to write? Mm. Favorite character? I don't know. I, I, I think I think something about um, I think something about the idea behind Benjamin Button in a way meant a lot to me because um, maybe not how he's presented or anything or the aging and all the you know the cgi stuff but i think um there's something about when she's walking with that when kate blanchett's walking with that baby that really got me and it happened to be the year both my parents died and um and there was a lot of things that meant things to me i uh, for instance i had a, out my window at that point i there was a hummingbird that was always come visit like i don't know once a week and so I put a hummingbird in the thing, you know what I'm saying? And uh, there was something that, I, I think the movie's wonderful and then I think it has some problems too, but I think it's kind of big, bigger than a bread box. And it, it, that really meant a lot to me. I'm not saying it's my favorite movie and I'm not sure Benjamin's my favorite character, but something about the soul of that movie has always moved me, you know? Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I love Forrest and anything you say. Someone's asking how I deal with writer's block, and I'll answer this: that I don't ever have it, never had it, and if I get stuck, I change the weather. So I want them to, in other words, make it rain in your scene, and you can move on because you have a whole different point of view. Thank you so much. Um, our last question: uh, As we are an academic institution, we'd like you to be a professor for a moment. If you were to assign one movie for students to watch to study screenwriting, what would it be? Uh, Godfather Two. Yeah, I mean, probably without a doubt. I mean, I think it has, um, I think, I think it has probably the, the most perfect scene ever written when he goes and visits uh, 
uh, Hyman Roth character in that little Florida uh, uh, house with the, with the, he even has a perfect football game on USC is on television. Everything about it is, I think, uh, I know Fincher feels that way and many other directors. I'm sure there'll be other things we could say. I could tell you, you know, some of the things that really move me and great things like uh, De Niro shadow boxing on the roof in Raging Bull or, you know, oh, I'll give you a great moment in movies. Another De Niro uh, in Goodfellows when the, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Ray Liotta's wife goes to collect something. She's on the block there and De Niro says, go into that doorway. And he goes like this, you know what I'm saying? You know, if she goes in that doorway, it's out. But those are the kind of little moments, man. You can't, you know, a, an actor can do that. I'll give you one quick thing. So on the movie, The Insider, which I think is a very good movie, um, probably great. Uh, but um, Al Pacino called me and, and I had written like a two page monologue. And he said, I, you know what, Eric, I can do this in a look. And I said, if Michael, the director, man, lets you do in a look, it's fine with me. And he did it. He did it right in a look, you know. So. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. Oh, I love this. Thank you. Uh, of course, we wish it was in person. Me you, you know, too. Well, maybe next year. Yeah, I mean, we do want to, whatever you want to show, we'd love to have you back. When well, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon we're going to show. That's 100%. <laughs> Great. So thanks so much, and uh, we will see you soon. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, you guys. Bye, everybody.